director of the Jesuit Forum for Social Faith and Justice. And uh, we're delighted to have all of you here with us today, uh, but particularly our invited guests, uh, Grandmother Irene, the co-founder of Minwashan Lodge, uh, Mike Mooney, Indigenous Education Lead from the Peterborough, Victoria, Northumberland, and Clarington Catholic District School Board, and uh, Sherry Sable, the Indigenous Education Advisor for the Halton Catholic District School Board. And of course, uh, all of you probably already know Victoria, who's been putting together this event and will be the, the main lead uh, today during this event. So welcome to everyone. Uh, I'm just going to begin now with the, with the land acknowledgement and then uh, from there I'll turn things over to Victoria. So let's just take a moment uh, to be aware first off of the land, the many different lands and territories where we're located today. But as we bring that into our awareness of land as being really a sacred community of which we're a part, a land as a living community of plants, animals, fungi, microorganisms, the air, the water, the soil, all those magical, beautiful things that make life possible, that sustain us, uh, that feed both our, our bodies and our spirits in so many ways. So just to acknowledge the land and at this time of spring, particularly when everything is bursting with life and the beauty of that and feeling gratitude for the land. And I speak to you today from the traditional lands of the Huron, Wendat and Petun First Nations, the Onodawaga, also known as the Seneca and the Mississaugas of the Credit River, this place that uh, many know as Toronto or Takaranto. And I'm sure that many of you come from, from diverse territories, uh, but we know that wherever we are, there are people who have inhabited this land for from time immemorial, really, uh, from going way, way back, and who are part of this, these lands and who have learned to live on these lands in a good way. And where I speak to you today, and probably many of you are as well, are in territories around the Great Lakes, which are subject to that dish with one spoon wampum, uh, which is such a beautiful image of uh, that agreement between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples to live peaceably, to share the gifts of the land in a way that was fair without taking more than they needed, but ensuring that everyone had enough and that all creatures could thrive and live peaceably together. So I'm aware as we begin today uh, that all of us in some way are treaty peoples and particularly with this district one spoon, uh, as someone living on this territory, I have a responsibility to live by that covenant, um, to seek out right relationships with all, but particularly with the people who have inhabited here uh, from time immemorial, but also with the land itself, with all the creatures to care for it, to live peaceably. Um, so right now what we're going to do is um, we're going to give a brief presentation of the guide listening to Indigenous voices for some of you that might not be familiar with it. Um, and then really we're going to open um, the floor for um, listening. So we're going to have Grandmother Irene um, speak to us and then um, Mike um, and Sherry um, just share their experience and their knowledge with us. Um, and at the end, we'll open it up for some questions and answers, um, as well as some reflection time. Uh, so with that being said, I think, Mark, you're going to share. Yeah, just get the screen up and let's see. Is it showing up okay? Yep. Okay. Uh, so listening to Indigenous voices, just a, a bit of background 
around the guide itself. So the, the Jesuit Forum uh, for Social Faith and Justice is in some ways is a, is a relatively uh, new area of, of work for us. Uh, this guide predates Victoria and I in the forum. Uh, when we came on to the forum team in 2019, there was already an advisory group who had already met several times and we're, we're trying to, to think about how to do this guide, the advisory group made up, made up of both indigenous and non-indigenous people. And uh, so Victoria and I came on to the team just under three years ago. And that's when a lot of, uh, you know, collecting and uh, curating and finding things uh, for the guide really, really began. But certainly, uh, I'll begin with this first slide and then and we can kind of alternate a bit back and forth. But uh, certainly the rationale of this guide, what the Jesuit Forum had done quite a bit before were these dialogue guides using a sharing circle methodology. Uh, so that kind of methodology of, of working with a session and then doing a sharing circle uh, was very much part of something the Jesuit Forum had done before. Uh, in terms of this guide, it really begins with the, the logic and rationale that uh, this part of Turtle Island that we call Canada does not have an indigenous problem, it has a colonization problem. And that a first step, and it is a first step, is that we need to listen deeply to indigenous voices and diversity of indigenous voices. And so the idea of this guide is really to uh, gather people to listen and, uh, and then to share and to reflect in the hope that that can be a way of fostering a real change of heart that results in a change in action as well. Uh, and so uh, as well as giving these uh, dialogue, the, the questions for sharing circle, uh, and this is the first time we've done this in the guide, we also included curriculum pieces. So things that could be used in a classroom, particularly in secondary schools. Uh, so this is very much, you know, from the beginning part of the logic of the guide that this could be used both with uh, high school students, but also, uh, with groups of teachers or any group of adults really uh, in terms of the guide. So at this point, uh, we'll just kind of run through quickly the, the, the sessions of the guide. I'll let Victoria start with the next one. So the first session uh, begins with uh, creation stories, uh, beginnings and there um, sort of highlights the uh, importance of listening um, in oral tradition. Um, so we have two creation stories, one Anishinaabe um, told by uh, Elder Jim Dumont uh, and one Abenaki creation story um, in French. Uh, and both of these stories can be found on the um, online component of the guide, uh, which will come up more and more, um, as well as exploring things like uh, a background of the people of Abayala um, and the importance of listening to stories. Um, and the guide follows um, uh, a bit of the first five sessions with the exception of uh, the exception of session two, we have uh, explore uh, indigenous worldviews uh, and indigenous knowledge. Um, and then session six through eight, uh, take a more linear historical approach to the history of colonization on Turtle Island. Um, and then sessions nine through 11, look at ways of moving forward uh, and concrete actions that, that we can take both on an individual level, but as well as sort of questioning some of those systematic structures um, of oppression that uh, indigenous people experience. Um, and I think session one is um, sort of a powerful way to get situated in that sense of the, the guide is not meant to be a, um, a book to be read, but rather a book uh, to explore together uh, and to come together and listen to each other on those reflections from what we hear. Yeah, and, and just to say this, the second sec session doesn't quite follow the logic of, of the indigenous worldviews. Uh, 
And actually, we've been playing around sometimes. You don't always have to do the sessions in the exact order that they're in the guide. Uh, some have suggested that maybe this session really should come a bit later when we start getting into the history of colonization. And that's fine. I mean, that can, you know, there, just because it's labeled session two doesn't mean you have to do it as the se second session. Uh, but certainly the second session is, is really looking at the situation of injustice that exists uh, in what we call Canada. And it begins with the story of the Oneida Nation of the Kims, which is in Southern Ontario, very close to London, uh, uh, First Nations community that does not have uh, safe drinking water, even though there is a uh, line with clean drinking water right across the road from, from the First Nation, basically. Uh, so that's used as a story to just get into that. But then there's also a piece by Art Manuel about uh, colonization, racism, and injustice. Uh, some look at exploring stereotypes of Indigenous people in the media and trying to deconstruct those, as well as some just key statistics about that demonstrate uh, the deep state of injustice that currently exists. And session three uh, looks at land uh, and uh, Indigenous knowledge uh, regarding uh, our relationship to land. So there, there are um, a lot of great pieces. Um, there's one by Jeanette Armstrong, um, Robin Wall Kimmerer, uh, who looks at the concept of, you know, is land uh, as belonging or as a source, as a source of belonging or um, as a source of belongings. Um, and then Joe, uh, John Mohawk um, and the Haudenosaunee greeting or the Thanksgiving address. So again, giving thanks to land and our relationship to land, um, as well as exploring land acknowledgements and how do we move beyond land acknowledgements, acknowledgements being um, sort of these empty gestures and, and what they're meant to do. They're meant to be a site of discomfort um, and that it's not enough to sort of be aware of indigenous presence or in um, our land, but what they call us to do. And the uh, fourth session is called Languages of the Land. Uh, so here there are uh, pieces, uh, one by John Boros on the on language as being uh, many indigenous languages as being animate. He talks about the sun, the rivers, the grass, it's a beautiful piece. Uh, there's a piece by David Begay, who, who's actually uh, a Dine from, from the US, uh, from New Mexico, who talks about connection, motion, and life. Uh, and then just some things around linguistic diversity and the importance of indigenous languages, and as well as you know the, the challenge of the loss of indigenous languages. Um, and session five um, looks at uh, treaties and treaty relations. So here, Nagan Sinclair um, has a piece that sort of explains that idea of uh, treaties being beyond uh, a, a signed document or an agreement uh, to trade or give up land, but rather that they call us to live in partnership um, with each other, to share the land with each other. Um, Sylvia McAdam here, um, talks about treaties as sacred um, and, and tells us stories about how um, indigenous peoples um, before colonization had treaties and how they approach them. Um, and as well, we look at some of the treaties uh, that, that were on. So the dish with one spoon, the two Rome wampum belt. Um, and I think one of the uh, special sessions here is also no such thing as, as ceded land, that treaties weren't meant to be an exchange in contracts, but rather that uh, all land is meant to be uh, shared and protected and respected. Then in session six, we start moving into the history of colonization, uh, which the first session here is called Early Encounters. So it begins with a piece that draws on a number of sources, including Sylvia McAdam, looking at the doctrine of discovery, which she describes as fairy dust. And I think it's a powerful piece about uh, challenging, about the, you know, how really the doctrine of discovery isn't just, you know, something that a pope four or 500 years ago 
proclaim, but something that still lives in Canadian law, you know, this underlying title of the crown as still being very active in Canadian law. Uh, and then we look at there's things like the early fur trade, uh, early missionaries, uh, the Great Peace of Montreal and the Treaty of Niagara. So really, uh, particularly, you know, up to probably uh, kind of pre-Confederation times, uh, some of the key historical pieces there in terms of colonization. Session seven, Killing the Indian and the Child, um, explores um, the residential school, the Indian residential school system. And here again, um, most of the printed guide is um, summaries, and we call on participants to use the online uh, portal uh, to listen uh, to stories of uh, residential school survivors, um, as well as stories of uh, resistance. Um, and this, the online portion was a way that we thought one, we could continue to update the guide as new information came about, um, but also the sort of to dispel this idea of a um, sort of one indigenous voice that there is a variety of voices and stories to be heard so that par participants using the guide could also um, have a chance to listen to stories that were within their own context uh, from from different traditions uh, and different backgrounds. Uh, session seven also explores uh, the Indian Act uh, and how it's very much um, alive today and the implications of it, um, as well as uh, the 60s scoop, uh, Inuit relocation, uh, and child labor uh, in sugar beet farms, which again is Sylvia McAdam, uh, shares that story with us. The session eight, it, it's looking at uh, colonization today uh, and using particularly this, we, we use quite a few pieces from Art Manuel, who has some really, I think, brilliant analysis that he's he often is able to summarize something in, in relatively few words, but get right to the point, uh, which is really a uh, wonderful gift. Uh, so he has this piece on dispossession, dependency, and oppression, which I think is a great analytical lens. Uh, Cora Morgan, uh, something on the child welfare system, how that continues as a problem today. Uh, the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls report and you know, that is an issue as well. And a piece by Beverly Jacobs on decolonizing the violence against Indigenous women. So as again, really trying to just keep in mind that, you know, the what happens with colonization is that it, it kind of sometimes morphs and changes modalities, but really the, the essence of it remains the same, like, a, like new uh, changing strategies to kind of achieve the same kind of colonizing goals. So uh, that's what, what this session is about. Um, and then as mentioned before, sessions nine through 11, look at ways of uh, moving forward. Um, and here we have a really powerful piece by Lee Miracle, um, who was um, an amazing uh, writer, poet, singer, activist, um, just an amazing uh, human being. And here um, her article is, you know, to forgive or to change. She looks at the concept of apology um, and how if an apology is empty without actions, um, then, then are we really apologizing? Uh, what are we expecting um, if there is nothing behind that apology? Um, and there's also uh, John Burroughs piece, Warming Relations. So looking at our relationship to land and how um, indigenous, right relationships with indigenous peoples uh, and ecological justice are very intertwined um, and how it's uh, about changing ourselves, um, having a change of heart. Um, and here we also have a piece um, that was written by Mark um, which is from a settler perspective, this idea of denial or guilt and how we can't just really be stuck um, on that. So um, session nine just kind of starts from the person and starts to uh, ask us to evaluate um, ourselves and how do we move forward? Uh, and uh, just note here in this image, you know, you'll see both this beautiful piece by Christy Belcourt and by Kent Mackman. I mean, there's a lot of throughout the guide, there's a lot of really 
a wonderful artwork by indigenous artists, which I think really bring it alive uh, in so many ways. Uh, so then in number session 10, it's pathways to decolonization, once again, drawing on Art Manuel, who speaks of some concrete steps that we need to take. Uh, some things about what does it mean to be a good ally or accomplice, uh, something on the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And then there's a great piece as well that uh, you can also watch as a video, which some of you may have seen by Nikki Sanchez about the idea that decolonization is for everyone. And the last session looks at re-indigenization and, and what is re-indigenization? Uh, Gregory Cajete um, explains that to us um, as well as two uh, beautiful pieces by Rowan White and Robin Wall Kimmerer um, about reseeding our relationships uh, and becoming indigenous to place. And both of these authors use uh, the imagery of seeds and plants so again, going back to our relationship uh, to land um, and the non-human world. Um, and this session also uh, explores ways in which indigenous peoples are uh, reclaiming, relearning um, and their own knowledge tradition. Um, so again, on the website, there's a, we try to highlight examples of work being done uh, by indigenous communities, um, on uh, language, education, um, land, so looking at land back, um, and ways in which we can uh, move forward, but also as settlers or newcomers, what where's our space uh, in terms of that conversation, where what might we find our space, as well as how can we um, how can we help? How can we walk with indigenous peoples um, in this decolonization process? And just a final note is this I think of the classroom connections that each session has uh, a class has a section on classroom connections. So some examples of that is learning about local sacred places, exploring contemporary indigenous music. Uh, there's a activity called the house, which actually comes from a piece of curriculum from the Northwest Territories about the violation of treaties. Uh, class debate on the doctrine of discovery. Uh, this one about writing a letter on the daily life in, in Indian residential schools, which I think, you know, there's been some cautions about that one, but I think uh, the idea of trying to really cultivate empathy and understanding about what that might have been like. Uh, tableau of Inuit relocations, how art is used as resistance. Uh, we, there's a knower's chair, uh, exercise based on the Lee, what Lee Marco wrote. And then the, there's a final one about trying to imagine different aspects of what a, a decolonized Canada might actually look like. At this point, I'm going to turn things over to uh, Victoria, who's going to introduce grandmother Irene. Thank you, Mark for that land acknowledgement. Um, at this time, I would like to introduce grandmother Irene, um, who is the co-founder of Minwachin Lodge, uh, located on unceded Algonquin territory, um, or otherwise known as Ottawa. And she's celebrating uh, 29 years of work there. Uh, she's a first generation survivor, um, survivor of the residential school system. And her work at the lodge supports women survivors um, of violence, assisting them with safety plans, stabilization, healing, employment, and education achievements. And Irene is the keeper of the stories at the lodge, uh, which connects indigenous women to their culture, identity, and pride. Um, it's always an honor to have grandmother Irene um, join us. Um, and I would like to offer you um, some tobacco, some virtual tobacco, thank you, um, for her to start us off. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk about the circle methodology and, you know, it, it, in our traditional ways, that circle is represented in all creation. Like you can see behind me the, the beautiful medicine wheel. And I often compare this medicine wheel to your journey through this, the, through this book and uh, the gatherings that you're going to have together, you know, starting in that eastern doorway where we're just little babies and we're just little uh, toddlers and we're just learning to walk 
and so we don't expect to know everything, but it's important that uh, we we be humble, uh, and you know, we don't have to know everything, uh, and so keeping that in mind through your journey, and then in that southern direction, that's where the the youth sit, in terms of stages of life, and when we think about think about yourself when you were a youth, you know, you were trying to figure out who you were. Uh, what was your gifts and skills? How are you going to uh, do things in the world? And we call those the wandering years. And I mean, when that's the whole beauty of the circle is there's no right or wrong way. There's just, you know, if there's just different. And keeping that in mind, uh, you know, thinking uh, positively before you're going into the circle that it's not a test about your knowledge. It's really about that interconnectedness that you're going to experience. And then traveling in that Western direction, and that's where the bear sits, and, and that's where the action happens. Um, I often compare this stage of life as adults. And when you're an adult, that's when you're a mother and a father, and you got children, you got career, you got... <laughs> community work, you got everything, right? And so a lot of us are in that stage of life. But you're also laying down your legacy. Uh, and so that's what I can compare um, that stage with uh, the development that you're going to receive in these circles that is that you're going to, you know, you're going to figure it out, like in that southern direction. And then in that adult stage of life, that's when you're going to take that action to make change. And then in that northern part of that medicine wheel, that's where the elders sit and that's where the wisdom comes in. And so the more circles you attend and the more, the more you take in, uh, you will gather that wisdom and you will carry that wisdom inside of yourself and you will share that wisdom. And that's what the, you know, the, the modules are all about, the circles are all about is, you know, taking those teachings and carrying them with you and actually, you know, spreading the word, getting, getting the message out there. Um, so in circle, we do have, there is a reason why we have circle. And it's a, it's a protocol. Just like when we opened up this gathering with uh, smudge. Uh, that's a protocol. When we open up with smudge, when the offering of tobacco comes, this is all um, gestures to ensure that there's safety in the circle. Um, passing that tobacco, uh, you know, gives us uh, thankfulness and, and thoughtfulness uh, about why we're here in the circle here today. And oftentimes you'll pass that tobacco to the elder because that elder will be holding space for you in the, in the circle. Um, so what else could I say? Um, yeah, those protocols are important because those protocols uh, provide safety. That's the reason why we have an opening. There's a reason why we have a closing. And there's so, like, the wisdom of our culture is, I mean, I continually, continually learn that beautiful wisdom. And it's so, it's so beautiful. And people are, once they experience it, sitting in a circle, uh, and they go through all these processes, uh, you know, they keep coming back because they want that feeling again. It's a feeling of safety and security and, and knowledge sharing and then taking action and going into the world and, and changing the world. And so, it's, you know, we have these protocols in place for a reason. And one of the most important thing is safety, that when you come into a circle, like, there's different types of circles, right? There's talking circle, um, there's a healing circle. Um, but I think these circles are more uh, informative. But again, you could be impacted by what is said in, in the circle. And oftentimes in some circles that I've been in, some of the settlers uh, blame and shame themselves. And, that, and that's not uh, what we want in the circle is we don't want them to carry that blame or shame, you know. It's not your fault. Let's just um, accept the truth, what happened, and 
make that commitment to make change. And I love it because you're bringing it into the schools because you're teaching the youth and you're teaching the like you're teaching them from the get go. And so they're, they're, they're going to get it. They're going to get it. And they're going to, you know, they're going to be already actioning things in their youth, you know, when they become teenagers and that's their role, right? They're going to be actioning things when they're adults and they're, when they're in the, in these spaces where they're making decision making like you guys are as, as a, as a, as a, a school board. And, and so, you know, I love all these protocols around circle. Um, so when we come into that circle, it's all about creating space. And we, that circle is represented by that medicine wheel. When you're sitting in circle, you're sitting in a medicine wheel. So there's always a doorway. See that yellow doorway? That's the Eastern doorway. And that's the doorway where we come from that spirit world onto, into our earth walk when we're born. And that represents that stage of life when we're newborns, uh, babies and toddlers and grade schoolers. And so um, that's the beginning. And um, so you are going to travel around that medicine wheel every time you, you meet in that circle. And I don't know, all the circles I've done and experienced, I always come away with a good feeling. As a matter of fact, oftentimes I don't even want to come out of the circle because it's so safe in that circle. It's, um, it's, you have to experience it to, uh, to understand it. Um, so I'm just checking the time here. Okay, I've I still got a couple more minutes. And so we often use um, a feather. I have uh, I have my fan here. Uh, and and if you don't have a feather, you can use maybe a rock. So this is a, a rock with the buffalo on it. And that buffalo represents respect. Oftentimes, I've seen the Inuit people use a rock. Because when you pass that rock onto each other, you'll notice how warm that rock is going to get. So you're imprinting your energy onto that rock and you are strengthening that circle by passing it uh, to one another. And, and, you know, when it goes around that circle and, you know, um, there's, when you do things in a line, um, there's not really any, any connection there. But if you do things in a circle, that energy is contained in that circle. And that's why it feels so um, caring and so supportive. And um, oftentimes we will use a talking stick. Um, but, you know, it doesn't have to, you don't have to do all these protocols. I mean, as long as we're respectful and I know we're online and there's no circle, <laughs> but we, as long as we've got that thinking and that concept that we are sitting in circle and that the facilitator is going around the circle on the screen, uh, we can uh, acknowledge that. It's, it's important to keep thinking like that circle. We're in a circle. We're in a safe uh, containment area. We, we are sharing. We're able to speak freely. And when you're in that circle, there is a certain level of consciousness that happens. Um, people that are afraid to speak or anything, they might pass. But then as the circle goes on, they start to feel comfortable because they feel like they belong in that circle. And that's the other um, protocol is to give people a sense of belonging and that interconnectedness and that safety. And so once they feel like they belong, then they're going to have trust. And then that's when they start sharing. And so, you know, these are kind of like the levels of consciousness that we go through when we're in circle. And, and we always know when we open up with that song and that tobacco that we've invited our ancestors. We come from a long line of ancestors and they like to visit us. And that's when they can come in the circle when we do that drum and those four honor beats is calling in all those four nations from the four directions. And so that's, you know, creating another uh, part of safety as well. 
So I'm going to stop there. Um, I hope I've uh, imparted some good knowledge to you in terms of the circle protocols. Chi miigwech. Thank you so much, Grandmother Irene. Um, it's always a pleasure and an honor to hear you speak. Um, and I think um, we've been involved in a lot of circles over the past year and a half with Grandmother Irene. And I can say that it is definitely, you know, you create, you bring a energy in a, in a safe space to it where we do feel that we're entering into relationship. And I think every time you finish a circle, you kind of feel like you're friends with the people in your circle, even though you might have only been together for um, two hours, um, which I think is important to highlight that, you know, while we at the forum have created this resource, I think the resource is secondary to this process um, of just learning to listen to each other and creating those relationships um, that are strong and based on mutual respect um, and friendship, I think, um, at the end of the day. So thank you so much for that. Um, and right now I'd like to introduce uh, Mike Mooney, who is the uh, Indigenous Education Lead for the Peterborough, Victoria, uh, Northern Berlin and Car uh, Carrington Catholic District School Board. That's a really long <laughs> name. Um, and um, Mike, we've sort of been in a um, contact since the launch of the guide and he's been um, sort of an advocate and partner for it and we've been learning together so it's a pleasure to um, have him here and share a bit on his experience um, with the guide listening to Indigenous voices but also in his journey um, of allyship and and what that might what that looks like for him so so grateful for you to be here today and I'll leave you the floor. Thank you so much. I just can I just get confirmation that my sound's working? Well, okay, great, wonderful. Well, hello everyone. My name is uh, is Mike Mooney, um, and I just I just want to begin by kind of situating myself. I came into this role as Indigenous Ed Lead in the board um, at the beginning of last year. I, I'm a non-Indigenous person myself. Uh, and when I introduced myself to an elder nearby in Curve Lake, he said, oh, Mike, um, what's your job? And I told him, and he said, oh, are, are you Indigenous? And I said, no. And he said, oh, my condolences. And that, that's kind of how I, I began, I, very, very naively and very eager to learn. And um, when I first, the first exposure I had to this resource was uh, the launch video. And in that uh, launch, I, I remember mostly listening to Sylvia McAdam and the timing of the launch, and I could be wrong, but I, I think the timing of the launch coincided with the initial announcements around the discovery of of bodies in Kamloops. And I just remember uh, hearing Sylvia McAdams say, you know, if you feel, if you feel guilt or you feel shame or you feel anger, like feel it, but don't stay there. Don't get stuck. And that spoke to me so loudly um, that I thought I just need to learn more about this process. And it also came to me at a time where as, a, as I was taking on kind of the responsibility that this role offered, I was challenged by some people I was working with to go out and start taking some risks. And one of the risks was to use, uh, facilitate sharing circles. Uh, I, I was really struggling with the idea of appropriation and appreciation. And, and it almost paralyzed in fear of making a misstep. Um, and these two ladies I was working with, Shannon Kimwan and Nicole Bell, who's a prophet at Trent, they said, Mike, just do it, just do it. And uh, so I did, I tried, I just tried and I did it in what I like to think was a very humble way. Um, and of course, it wasn't face to face at that point in time. It was virtual. So all of this newness was happening. And I tried so many different iterations of sharing circles. But what I had the fortunate experience of was sitting in participating 
in a circle that was actually facilitated by Grandmother Irene. And I remember more the feeling than I do the kind of what was said in the circle. I just remember feeling exactly as she described, this sense of safety and invitation to vulnerability that I hadn't really experienced in another place. And the warmth and courage it took to sit in that circle, um, not just on my part, but on all people present, gave me such a sense of hope for the work I was trying to do that uh, it was enough motivation to, to give it a shot. So there I go, I bought 10 copies of the book and I started uh, knocking on doors and seeing if anybody would like to join me in this. And, and everyone said yes. So uh, you, I kind of fast forward to September and I was uh, thinking, all right, we're gonna launch this with every principle in our system. Uh, so there are 36 of them. We have directors meetings. I'm sure the folks on this call know all about those and they're fairly formal events. And they're in a boardroom and they're on a, at least two or three devices at once and listening at the same time. So that's the atmosphere you walk into. Um, and I ask them to close their computers, turn off their phones, pick up their chairs and walk outside and sit in a circle. And I had five teammates with me and we had five circles. And uh, of course, I forgot to tell them to wear comfortable shoes. So, so some people had high heels and they're sinking into the grass. And so I didn't, I didn't win too much favor with that, but we did get outside. And what we noticed was that we were kind of grossly unprepared for the content. Um, we began with session one on uh, creation, but what we found is that, um, we just really needed principles to see each other in a different way. And that's what happened. They sat in a circle and they saw each other in a way that they hadn't maybe before. And these are people that work together all the time, but they work together in a, in a system that is very, very much designed around hierarchy, um, is very much a colonial structure. And we were, I didn't recognize it at the time, but we were attempting to challenge the structures and the hierarchy by leveling the playing field in a circle. And if I thought my circles were tough, the superintendents and the directors sat in their own circle. And that, again, what a challenge that is to park all of the structure for a period of time. And so I had two opportunities to do that. Um, once in September and once in November. And that was what I thought. I thought that then we would just continue on after and, and I was horribly wrong. It, in many ways, uh, the, by design, we failed. Um, it didn't, we didn't have enough time during the workday for principals to continue with it. They got the book. And it turned out that was the easiest part of the process was to get people the book. And we recognized very quickly that uh, the power or the transformational experience came not from the book, but from the circle. And uh, the spinoff effect though, where, where I felt we really gave ourselves a chance at transformation was that the group of facilitators, there were five of us, we continued to meet in circles uh, to go through listening to Indigenous voices. And we found very quickly that there was incredible um, power in those circles. The language I have, I, I grew up going to church. I'm the oldest of six children. I, I went to mass a lot as a child. Uh, and the language in my house to describe that power would have been the power of the Holy Spirit. That, that's what my parents, my grandparents would have used. And, it, and in my mind, it always describes something you couldn't see, but that you could feel if you were paying attention. So we were sitting in circles and I found that people were encountering vulnerability in ways that we would not otherwise experience. We were confronting biases that we may have grown up with. We were challenging colonial structures. We didn't even know we're there. 
And over time, we were moving, I, I started to realize we were moving together. So, so we gathered people that were coming at this learning journey from various points or, or, or stages in learning. I think often of the path that uh, Murray Sinclair described as climbing a mountain. And I think we're all at different points on that pathway and we would come together. And we decided what mattered the most was our relationships. What mattered most was like being, uh, being together in the circle. And because of our commitment to listen to each other, we started to learn how to listen. And we learned through the circle. We didn't know how to, I would say, going in. We just began to learn how to listen. And I think we began to experience a uh, transformation, really. And, and over time, so, so the work, what we set out, to accomplish was to change the minds of principles, uh, to, to allow principles to experience this transformation that would magically set our students on this path and change schools. And we were thinking big. And I haven't given up that hope at all, but I really quickly came to realize that um, what needed to happen and is still happening is the transformation of ourselves. Uh, and it's all at the hands of the experience in the sharing circle. Um, we didn't have Indigenous voices in our circle, but we saw, we, we recognized that barrier, but felt that much as I think Mark described early on, we were attempting to address a problem of colonization the, and we recognized that we had work to do regardless of who was with us or not. And so that was the mindset we took. We, we just felt we, we needed to start our journey. And, um, and so we did. And um, we're at this point now where uh, it's starting to surface in ways that we would never have planned. We're looking at restorative practices in schools and visiting uh, the influence of indigenous pedagogy and ways of knowing in restorative practice. This is something we did years ago and never considered indigenous ways of knowing. So the, the implication of committing to the process is paying off in ways I never could have imagined. And so I guess when I think of, I think the subtitle under my name is Encountering Systemic Barriers or Challenges. And I, I think what I'm recognizing or what, what maybe I'll, I'll end my contribution with is that uh, we, be, we began thinking about the product of change. That if we buy these books and roll these books out, things will happen and things will change. And we're at this place now where we're seeing the change that we desire as being the result of a process and that we have to engage in daily and stay committed to. And in the course of committing to that process, we found uh, relationships we didn't know were there and we've gotten to know people in ways that we never would have had we not committed to that. Um, so that's how we're trying, we're attempting to overcome systemic challenges. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, when I reached out, I knew Mike was sort of in this process of using the guide. And when I reached out to hear how it had gone, um, he sort of shared this uh, story with me. Um, and we were, I think at first we were like, oh, is this a story of failure? And really, as we, as we spoke in that conversation that was supposed to be, I think, 15 minutes that turned into an hour was um, sort of a, I think, a story of success of, you know, um, learning to listen, learning to um, slow down. I think sometimes we, um, sometimes with good intentions, we want to move really, really fast. Um, and then that means that we're striving for change within uh, these systems, these colonial systems um, that are put in place and on purpose do not allow this work to happen. So sometimes, you know, part of that work is um, learning to slow down and, and rethink the way that we do things. Um, 
So thank you so much, Mike, for that. Um, that's a great story uh, to hear. Um, and then our um, next speaker um, is Sherry Sable. She's the Indigenous Education Advisor for the Halton Catholic District School Board. Um, and Sherry is a Cree woman from Treaty 6 territory uh, with a degree in Native Studies and Criminology from the University of Saskatchewan. Um, and Sherry developed her passion for Indigenous issues through personal experience and professional life. Um, she's a mother uh, and all of her aunts and uncles are were survivors of the residential school system. She comes from a family of 10 children uh, who were all part of the 60s scoop. Um, and she is the first generation to, rise, uh, to raise her children without government interference. Um, she has been studying, volunteering, and working uh, in First Nations issues for over 25 years on a wide range of social, political, and legal issues like poverty, housing, child and family services, treaty rights, education, and legislation impacting First Nation. Um, and I met Sherry, I reached out to her when the guide was published um, uh, to get her opinion on the resource and how she might see it um, used within her own school board. Uh, and it turned out to be just this really energizing conversation about all of the work that she had been doing um, and what a sort of beautiful, um, what a strong indigenous curriculum can look like and sort of the, just to hear that that work is being done um, in collaboration with indigenous communities um, around her, um, as well as the school board uh, and the space being provided. Um, so I'm really excited uh, to hear uh, Sherry share some of that with us uh, and I'll leave it at that. Well, thanks for having me and thank you, uh, Grandma Irene and Mike for your words and, uh, and, and beautiful uh, encouragements. Uh, it's important to hear the, the, the stories and it's important for non-Indigenous educators to hear the stories of uh, non-Indigenous educators doing this work as well. Um, so there's a lot to, you know, when we, I just want to tell you just a tiny bit, I guess, about myself first. Um, most of it is uh, in, in that bio, and sometimes it's uncomfortable to, for other people to read it. Um, and it's just uh, one of those things that, uh, like Irene had said, where Grandma Irene had said, is that, you know, we, we introduce ourselves in order to make the space comfortable as well. Um, you know, my, this work has never, back up a minute, um, this work is never easy. Uh, but when you have the support of a school board and you make the space comfortable and the space safe for those missteps and no, um, you know, no attitude, I suppose, uh, for the lack of a better word, then there's an awful lot that you can build when you stand shoulder to shoulder. And we always do that when we're, especially when we're in a circle, you'll notice that when you're in a circle, you are shoulder to shoulder. You are looking at each other's eyes. You are at the same level as everybody else. And there's no hierarchy. So what we've done in our, in our school board, and I've been with our school board now for 10 years, at the very beginning, I was shared. Uh, my position was a shared position between both the public board and the Catholic board. So you can imagine the, the, the heaviness of both school boards with different focus and different uh, realities. The public school board has uh, close to 120 students and the Catholic board has close to about, I don't know, 35 or 33,000 30, students. So there's an awful lot of uh, learning that had to happen way before, way before I started my role. There was no, there was nothing embedded in the curriculum in either school board, except for what was in the curriculum mandated, right? You know, in grade five or grade seven, whatever those other uh, points were, the jump off points. So there was an awful lot of professional development that had to happen, and. My, my um, focus really was to educate the director, uh, the superintendents, as well as the teachers. And so we kind of did that top and bottom approach where hopefully we'd meet somewhere in the middle. There, and with it, I'm not a Catholic um, and I'm not, um, I'm not Christian, but I am very spiritual. 
And so I, I need to say that as well. I work in a Catholic system and I'm not Catholic, but they know that. And I have the support of my school board, the Catholic school board. And there is still an awful lot of anger within um, education when it comes to uh, the Catholic order. That's not my role. That's not my role to talk about what, um, what that role was. Uh, we all know what the role was, but that's way beyond my pay grade. Um, that is a, a conversation to be having with the leaders, with people, with, with people across the pond. So I don't talk about, you know, we know we acknowledge it, um, but, but something like that is uh, beyond my pay grade. So I, I uh, will talk about it, but I won't, um, if you know what I mean. Anyhow, um, so, you know, I, I liked how Grandma Irene has said too, that, um, you know, don't, don't get in a place of shame and blame and guilt because, and I think uh, also Mike had said that as well, because that'll freeze you. We here at the board that we do, that we work with is that we acknowledge and we need to move, move through, uh, through this together. When you sit in circle, it is very, very powerful. Um, and a lot of things, even when we're not doing anything when it comes to the, the book, but every single time that we sit in circle, it's powerful. Every time that I go into a classroom, every time I do any sort of professional development, everything is done in a circle. It's not done in that linear where I'm speaking to the students at, at that. I've always, always done stuff. I've always done all my work in a circle. And, uh, and it's very, very powerful. There's, uh, and, and setting that, setting that um, secure and safe place is really, really important. And we have to be vulnerable to do this work as well. When you're an indigenous person doing this work, you're at a little bit more vulnerability, I suppose, because people will wanna lash out. Um, and, and, that, and I'm only speaking from experience and, uh, and people will wanna lash out or try and think that, you know, because uh, the Catholic, order has run a lot of 80 percent of those residential schools but there must have been some good that came from that and i always say absolutely not that is my my mom was taken away so how is that even a good a good thing she might have learned how to read and she might have learned how to write but she but there was no high expectations in those in those schools whatsoever they were uh, military schools they were prisons our parents could never leave. And if they did leave, they were severely punished. So there's nothing good in those schools ever. We need to have those honest conversations. And even when I go to parishes, I've been speaking at parishes in my, in my region. And, um, and I'm always welcome back. <laughs> um, only because I speak the truth. I am a I'm an eagle feather carrier, and so I must speak the truth. That's my obligation, and my elders have held me up in that regard. That I am there to speak our truth, but most importantly, my truth of what I see as the role of Indigenous education in in our in our uh, curriculum in Ontario. When I came to see the listening to our voices. Um, it was our religious studies consultant who had purchased them and then had uh, given them to me to look over and to vet for our, our school board. And at first I was hesitant because here was another, here was another booklet created by non-Indigenous people, or so I thought, created by non-Indigenous people for Indigenous people. And I just kind of put it aside without even opening it up. I just kind of thought, ah, oh, it's, you know, something again, you know, something for us without our contribution. But then it sat on my desk for a little while with the, with the booklet facing me. And so it was calling me to open it up. And once I opened it up and read the, read the front matter, I was kind of, I was astounded. I was kind of like, oh, wow, this is amazing that 
the Jesuit um, Forum for Social Justice has really engaged Indigenous people because this is really the work of uh, the, the work that we do as well. That we're engaging people. That's we're we're telling. They're telling their story and not us telling the story. When I read through a lot of the the sections in there, you know, some of them are my role models that I've studied under, and uh, and looked at that and thought this is you know this is absolutely amazing. It is some jump off points for for certain things, but it's also one of the things that I you need prior knowledge. You just can't just turn around and do uh, do any of these exercises without prior knowledge. So it so you as educators have to do a little bit of your own homework. We we um, we know that education is fluid. Education can pivot. Um, and we've seen how education pivoted over the pandemic and, and how it was different learning for different people. Just like in here in this, in this, in this booklet, because it does come off of um, some of the learning from the Kairos blanket exercise. And, you know, and knowing that that Kairos blanket exercise is very impactful for a lot of people and, uh, and, and having Indigenous people learning and doing with Kairos was, was amazing. And that's how come Kairos Blanket exercise was so successful. When we're looking at various things in here, um, you know, and I see that a lot of Indigenous people have all their, every, every section in here has an Indigenous author. So again, it's that inclusive, inclusive piece where, again, nothing for us without us because constantly, and I know what my education was like, I, I, I quit school in grade 10 because there was nothing in high school for me. And uh, of course I went to school later on in life and became, uh, you know, have through mature admission mission in the university. But how important these, these resources are when we have indigenous voices present and how impactful that they can be because we are the ones that uh, have, have lived through this. And we still have people who are still alive today that witness uh, a lot of the things that they that they've gone through. My mom um, just passed away the year the year before uh, the Truth and Reconciliation went into her community in Saskatchewan, and so I know that uh, that that would have been really important for her to maybe to attend. I attended on uh, I attended the one in Saskatchewan because I'm from there and that's my hometown our home community, I mean, and how impactful it really was to be witness, but also very empowering to see so many Indigenous people come together to bear witness. And that was really, really important for a lot of people, but also the fracturedness of our communities, because I went to one in Edmonton and I met my great auntie that I never even knew I had a great auntie. And so relationships and relatives were found through these truth and reconciliation um, events. And, uh, and that was very, very impactful for me. And when I met my great auntie, she had, she had held my hand and she had said to me, she said, my girl, we've been waiting for you. Welcome home. And I cried like you wouldn't believe that I cried. But it's also those healing things for us, for the residential school survivors, for my mother, for knowing all the horrible things that she went through, but also to take her strength and tenacity to, to be able to lend my voice, uh, what little voice that I have, lend my voice to educate and to really be that powerful Indigenous woman, because I know I am. I have my ancestors behind my back every single day, and I can feel them every morning when I wake up. And, uh, you know, that, and they're the ones that are holding me up and holding me up when I, when I feel that I'm, that this work gets too hard and, uh, and, and too, and, and, and having maybe just, just getting too hard, but also having to look after ourselves because nobody else is going to look after us. We have to have our own, uh, way of self-healing, of mental health, of, uh, of walking and sitting beside our own trauma, but also moving through that trauma and understanding where it came from. 
And that's really, really important. And on my healing journey of all the people that has been on, on not only my ancestors behind me, but my, but my friends and my family that stand shoulder to shoulder with me and hold me up. There is, and I, and I find great comfort in our medicines, um, having those medicines and in our school, having uh, a smudge bowl in every single high school in, in Halton while in the Catholic school board. And not for anybody just to turn around and do smudging. It is for when our elders come there and they see a smudge bowl that they know that they are welcomed and they are there. We're trying to create a safe place for our community. I've done lots and lots of work with the police and I've done lots and lots of work with the fire department to, to, for them to understand the importance of our medicines. Um, in the Catholic school board, you're not allowed to have an open flame uh, or a candle, but within what, what, what we do, it is an open flame and it is, we do light our, our smudge when our elders are there and they can, they can participate. So it's been a lot of learning, um, a lot of partnering with um, some of the, um, some of the priests in our area so that they understand the importance of that, taking our chaplains to various areas like Manitoulin Island, where there is a, a beautiful uh, chapel there that uh, is, is, um, has indigenous perspectives and the medicine is included in the mass. Um, and the priest has a buckskin vest, vestment, right? That the community has made for him. And so having those different experiences so that our Catholic schools and our Catholic leaders can understand that there's a place and space for, um, for, for us and that we're not going to be relegated outside when we go and smudge. We're not asking any other religion to uh, go outside to pray to their God or to their creator. So why are you asking Indigenous people to do that? So that was a big learning for our board. But now, you know, I've been doing this work for 10 years. And so there's lots and lots of well, the work in the school board. I've done, been doing this work for forever since I graduated from university in 1992. And um, so 10 years that I, or 10, 15 years that I've been doing this work here in our board. Um, yeah, I think it's 12 years actually. Um, anyhow, doing the work in our board has started with nothing to now see that the trustees um, are actually understanding a lot more about the role that they have. And when, and then when um, you can look at the budget within a school board and see that a priority is indigenous education, that, that means that's a lot, that means an awful lot. I certainly do get um, all of us in, our, in, in the Ontario, get money set aside from the Ministry of Education for Indigenous Education, but this money came from the school board budget. And so that speaks volumes too, when the school board budget is being used for Indigenous education and not just using our, um, the money that we get from the ministry. We've also increased uh, exponentially Indigenous uh, art, as well as our literature, our, the grade 11, grade 11 uh, in Indigenous literature, which is a prerequisite for college or university. And we advocated for that for quite a, quite a few years with the Ministry of Education to make sure that that is a prerequisite that can be used for uh, college or university and workplace so that, that that is there. And so now we've got exponentially um, so many non-Indigenous people that are taking training that have done various things. We've, we've created uh, leadership, uh, um, sessions and training for our non-Indigenous uh, teachers so that they feel comfortable and confident to teach some of this really, really difficult, um, really difficult topics. But then, you know, but then there's always hope, right? Um, right now we have a project that's going on in our school board with the residential school survivors, and it's called a Quilt of Hope. And the, uh, the schools, the residential school survivors will go into the schools and talk. And then from there, the students will do some art piece of what they've learned from the, from the residential school survivors. And then now it's transposed onto a quilt and we have quilt makers that are doing these beautiful quilts. And so, you know, it's, it's all that, the hard, the hard topics are also there 
but there's also hope and that we have to move forward into, into this hopeful place and space. Never, ever, ever, never taking away from everything that has happened. And somebody had also in here had uh, quoted Justice Sinclair that, you know, education got us into this mess and education is going to get us out. And we are going, we are in the road of reconciliation. Um, yes, we're at the truth telling stage. Don't get me wrong. That's going to take a long time because there's some people that are still the deniers of, uh, of residential schools. But there is more that's happening in our, in our area uh, than ever before. The towns, the communities, and the, mis the minis municipalities, sorry, are also making commitments uh, to endorse the, the, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities when it comes to the truth and reconciliation. Our, our town here in Milton will be launching an orange crosswalk in honor of the kids that went to residential school and the kids that never came home. But that's all been done by our residential school survivors and our elders. And that motion was unanimously uh, unanimously supported through our town council, but that came, the, the resolution first came from us to ask that for our, for our community. So, you know, I, I know that I've spoken a little bit, maybe more than what I should, but I know that this, this the book, if you get back to the book, <laughs> is a good start off point, is a good starting point uh, for learning, but also to have that prior knowledge and to be very vulnerable with your students by saying, you know, if you don't know, tell them. Uh, let's learn this together. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, and let's learn it together. And if you do, that's fine, but always make sure. And when it's certain things and certain topics, to always ask an elder or a knowledge holder to come in and, uh, and, be, and, and, and be with you side by side. My dream in the Halton Catholic District School Board is to have an elder in every family of schools. And so that elder would be able to move around in every family of schools. And that would be, um, and just like our chaplain, right? Or our, our, our animators, that they, had, that they would work so closely with the chaplains and the animators. And, but we would have an elder in every single uh, family of schools, which is 10. So we have about four elders that we're, that we're working with right now. But so I need, I'm, I'm looking for six more. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Um, to, to, to fulfill that, uh, that desire and that dream that I have before I retire uh, from this position. It's not for a few years yet, but until I get my elders in place and it's solid and, and stuff like that, I will stay in this position for a while longer. So Victoria, thanks for having me. Uh, Grandma Irene, I really look forward to meeting you in person one of these days. And same with you, Mike. It's been a pleasure to have these conversations together. Thank you so much, Sherry. It's always uh, beautiful to hear you speak and to hear about your experience. I think I say this every time I talk with you, but I always feel like I have so much more energy um, after it just because it's you can see the work being being done and and how how beautiful that can look. So thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, Mike, Irene and Sherry um, for sharing their knowledge with us and their experience and just sort of these first steps to seeing how we can how we can continue to do this work together. Uh, so what I would suggest at this point, we we want to finish off fairly soon, but if there were any questions or anything coming out of the groups, I think we could take a few minutes for that. Uh, so any reflections coming out of your groups or any questions that you'd like to pose? Um, I can go first. Um, so in our group, we um, we went around in the circle and discussed what struck us the most. And some of the things um, that came out of that conversation, sort of some words were uh, courage, um, the courage to sort of take that first step, um, not hesitating. Um, grandmother Irene sort of phrased it in, you know, knowing that we have the creator support and sort of just just going, uh, but also being humble to be taught, uh, to be taught by youth, I think, to trust the youth that they can teach us. Um, and I think that circle process 
um, sort of visually shows us the, the beauty of a non-hierarchical structure where we all have a space to, uh, to listen. Um, to focus on uh, the positive changes that we're seeing, uh, to have the patience uh, and to acknowledge that things are changing and you know what we're doing is working. Uh, so sort of to take, take some energy from that and knowing that it is making a difference. Um, to not be stuck with our Catholic guilt for those of us who either associate, um, identify as being Catholics or grew up within the Catholic um, education system, um, that that guilt um, is fair to feel, um, but that it shouldn't um, freeze us or prevent us from, you know, taking those steps uh, forward. Um, and that sometimes guilt, you know, can close us off and make us become uh, protective towards um, our faith or our identity and that that sort of need to hold on to it prevents us from from listening uh, to what others are saying. I can attempt to share a few things in our group. I'll, I'll also ask anyone else to add things, but I, some of the things that I remember hearing, I remember uh, Michael talking about the t-shirt about uh, shifts happen. <laughs> <laughs> shift <laughs> happens uh but it really what this is about this is a long process but it's also it, it this isn't an add-on <laughs> to the curriculum uh this is about a deep transformation of, of the way we do education it's about decolonizing education and so that's a big challenge uh it's, it's not a simple thing and i think you know one thing that, that Sherry said that, that struck me was that, uh, you know, don't, in school boards or in schools, don't ask for mission, permission, just do it. And then if you have to ask for forgiveness or, <laughs> but, you know, go ahead, like, don't be afraid, try things, go ahead, uh, you know, it needs to happen. And, uh, you know, if you wait for permission to, to happen, uh, that's just going to, probably slow things down, but I'll, I'll let other people add things. And there might be other things from the first group as well that people want to add or things that struck them that they thought, uh, or questions that arose. Anything else or is that just like the, the contented kind of side? Ah. I, you know what, I, I wouldn't mind asking. I, I can't get my eyes off the medicine wheel in the background of Grandmother Irene's screen. Mm -hmm. um, and it's actually the, that is the orientation that I've seen in this area used a lot, but then I've seen colors in different orientations and uh, different orders throughout, throughout. And I wondered, you know, I think I think what I'm growing into these days is that that in my work I've become a, a I call it uh, and I've gotten this from Nicole Bell medicine wheel pedagogy for and it's a way of understanding how we can engage in learning with students and following the directions and the order the 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 north in that situation was the place of action the so if, and I'll go real quick, but the East was sort of, what am I seeing for the first time here? What is new learning for me? And the South was about connecting emotionally or if feeling, how do you feel about this learning? And the West was making sense, reasoning, and the North was doing. So all connected to each other and all iterative and cyclical. Um, and that's really become that along with sharing circles has really driven uh, the dr or driving uh, work that I'm engaging in sort of in a foundational way. But then I hear different teachings and sometimes I get wondering, you know, am I, I don't pretend in ever to understand more, but I, t I feel like I take pieces every now and again and then wonder how to fit them together. And I, I just thought I'd share that maybe grandmother arena and just see what you what came to mind for you? Yeah, so there's uh, different teachings in different territories. I mean, I've seen in that Western direction a blue color. And, and so it depends, you know, wh where you're situated with the teachings from your area. 
so I'm from the west, so, so we have the buffalo, but out here in the east in Ontario, we have the turtle that sits in that that southern direction. So um, I think I think it depends where you're teaching from. Like if you're, where, where are you from, like teaching from? I'm in what, Peterborough, so. Okay, uh, so this talking. behind me is what you would follow because this is that this territory, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, you could get, see, I, I just, I just stick with one because yeah. it can be very confusing. <laughs> and, you know, you could, before you, you even talk about the medicine wheel in your territory, just this, these teachings are from this territory, or I've learned this teaching from an Ojibwe elder or, or yeah. something like that, because there's no right or wrong way. People might say, oh, you've got the wrong direction. But you know what? No, you don't. It's there's no right or wrong way. It's it's those teachings from that territory. Wonderful. Thank mm -hmm. you. But you. You stick with one so it's clear for you, you know. Mm -hmm. If anyone's interested, I, I mean, I'd have to look up the reference, but uh, you know, on the final page of the guide, there's the thing about the medicine wheel, but that's taken actually out of a, there was a book that probably came out like 30 years ago that was a uh, I'm trying to remember the name of it, but it was a meeting of elders, I think, that took place in Lethbridge, and they did all these things about the medicine wheel. But it's a lovely book because it gives many different interpretations as well, and it it's, has you know, pretty drawings, and it's kind of like a meditation book almost. I would describe it more than, uh, it, but but it, you know, I, I could look it up, but it, it's, it would be the final reference in the guide pretty well. If, if you look that up, they're, they're posted online and you can find that. So perhaps uh, uh, if, if we're okay, we should be drawing this to a close now. It's been, been wonderful to have everyone, everyone here and uh, taking time and listening and particularly you know for for the wisdom of grandmother Irene of Michael of Sherry it's been really really good I, I think there's been some really rich reflections